the, the idea here is that this is not, uh, as I said at the beginning, the idea of this event is not to have like very leading edge discussions about what will happen in the kernel, but instead to build community, right? To get to know each other, to get to know the best practice, to point to things to the other, to learn with each other. So it's an easy going event anyways. And, uh, and the idea here is, <clears throat> is that we could, we could chat, uh, we would have Thomas here, but we, we have like, I, I work with the scheduling part on the real time, with tooling, we have uh, uh, Sebastian that maintains the parameter T, we have Kate that manages the community and tries to get people together. So I, I think we, we can, the idea is for us to sit down here and okay, and, and think why, what have we, what we have been done, doing in the last years for, to make the push forward, what motivated us, right? <clears throat> and what we are doing as development for the, for the next, uh, for the near future. And uh, we'll start talking here. And if you guys have any questions and would like to go deeper on any argument, just raise your hand, join the talk. This, this is just a, a chat among us as a community, right? Should we start? Sure, let's start. So maybe I'll, I'll, I will start with, with Kate. Okay. Hey, Kate, what, what, is, what is the motivation be, behind the, this, this event or the real-time community within the, the Linux Foundation? What, what motivates us? Um, <coughs> well, there was a problem out there. And there was a problem that uh, a lot of people want to use preempt RT and want to use real-time scheduling, and it was outside of the kernel for a long, long time. And so um, a variety of companies got together and said, okay, we'll help fund doing it properly, doing it right, doing it upstream. And so it's been about an eight-year journey at this point now, and I think we're pretty close, Sebastian, right? Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> I that mean, that would be good. <laughs> we say this like year after year, um, but if you look for the patch queue, what we had like in 3.0, in 4.0, in 5.0, in 6.0, um, it's way less um, core code, yeah. and it's mostly drivers that are Out. left over. And mm -hmm. the only core code part we have is like the print K department. And other than that, oh, we is don't... Is it almost done for print K? Um, so for 6.0, by the time Linux released it, it was said that there is nothing special. Uh -huh. And I tried to sneak in RT into it because basically I was going to disable the printing to the console. And this uh -huh. is technically our only problem. So you would boot the system with RT enabled. You wouldn't see anything on the console, on nothing. But you could do DMask and see all the messages. And Linus saw this, and he was not really amused about it. No. <laughs> I was, about, I was okay. about to ask you, what happened then? <laughs> yeah. So then he asked us to just revert this, and uh -huh. then I was like, okay, then this is not going to happen now. Then we just yeah. have to move on. Just keep going. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, um, <clears throat> to the credit, I guess, we had enough of um, companies join in to help create and fund a pool so that we could actually have the work done properly and fund it. And, you know, this wouldn't have been possible without various members subscribing and helping it. And it wouldn't be possible without you and Thomas's team working on it. And so, um, you know, over the years, we've had ARM, BMW, Ericsson, Google, Intel, uh, IBM, National, NXP, and... We've had some of the Red Hat, of course. Oh, of course. For you. Of course. Um, we've had the OSAL group who started doing some of the real-time stuff earlier on, and they've been engaged. So it's Texas Instruments, and then some of the Linux Foundation projects like the Civil Infrastructure and Lelisa projects have helped chip in to see if we could actually get uh, this preempt RT upstream. And, you know, I think over this eight-year period, I think about 5.7 million or so has been raised wow. to actually do this bit by bit. And so, you know, doing things upstream in the kernel, and doing them right, and doing them over this period of time really does take an effort in a community to get behind it, even if it's not. And when we sort of started it, we really didn't have like a whole team of stable maintainers maintaining yeah. the backports. And there's been a team that's been formed for doing that. We and they're meet all every two weeks. Yep. For that. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, you can tell us. About, you can tell them about what you guys are doing in that because you're on that call all the time. Yeah. And so I'm, Sebastian, I'm more, for that matter. Yeah. <laughs> He's telling Sebastian. us what's happening there. No, I'm. I'm more in, in the things around. I'm not working directly with PremTRT. I'm working more with the scheduling side and tooling side. Right. I'm more participating on that side of the meeting. The PremTRT bits are. It's more on the, on Sebastian side. Right. I mean, <clears throat> we meet like every other Friday, and we discuss, like, if everyone has problems with things backporting, if there are things to be backported. And um, sometimes Greg picks up things that collide um, with the other releases because RT back then had something different. So then I look or someone else says what needs to be done or what he did, so he proposed, and we check if this is what's supposed to be done. And sometimes we this, uh, noticed after the release was done that something, something broke. And then when we decided to do RC kernels for like the, for the review on the list before doing the actual release, and I think this helped a lot. I, yeah, I, yeah. I think you know the fact that Red Hat and SUSE and all these other distros have stood, up, you know, come to it and help keeping these backports going because it's in their own interest to keep them going mostly. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, but it's a lot of work. <clears throat> it's a lot of work to keep backports going. So getting everything upstream is obviously going to help us, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah, and and. After all these years working upstream, uh, I, I get to the point of why it's not a good thing to cut corners on merging code, right? For example, we have been working in the, in the RT throttling problem for, for five years now, it, which is in the scheduling side, it's not on the parameter RT side. And, and many of the ideas that we had over the time, they would lock us in the future because we would be added in an option that we would regret. And we know that when we add an option that we regret in the future, we cannot take it anymore because people start depending on it. <clears throat> so having doing this, cutting these corners on the upstream development, they doesn't help. No. It's so do we have something no. now for the RT throttling issue or? We, the throttling, what is the throttling problem, right? We see many people here disabling the RT throttling as a, a setup, right? That's a good, that's a, a pure sign that that thing is not working well. <clears throat> and the main problem, what, what is the idea of the throttling? Is that when you have like an RT task that doesn't behave, that runs like for a long time or forever, what, what happens? It, it could end up uh, causing starvation on the non-real-time tasks that need to run on that CPU. And one would say, wow, but you can remove the task, but not... The way, the problem is basically that you look after the system without knowing what happens. Yeah. If you disable the RT throttling, you lock up the system, because there might be some CFS work that end up on that CPU holding a lock. Well, you don't see any console output, your SSH is dead, and you yeah. don't see what happened in the yeah. end. Right. Yeah, for example, K workers that, that are per CPU and that, that might start holding a lock. Exactly. Right? So the throttling serves to avoid this, this starvation. The problem is that the current mechanism, it, uh, it is not aware of what is running on the CFS. So by default, a busy loop real-time task, it, it, uh, it runs for 95% of the time, and then the entire IR cube is throttled, <clears throat> depending on what is going on on the CFS, right? And this is bad because you can only run 95%. You would like to run 100% of the time, right? So <clears throat> instead of pursuing this idea of a throttling the, the RT run queue, Peter came with the idea of uh, instead of doing this, we should boost the CFS as a real-time task, right? <clears throat> and the way that we are doing it is we are encapsulating the, the CFS inside of a SCAD deadline reservation. So we reserve a piece of the scheduling time, like a, a runtime in a period, like a scheduled deadline task, but not to a task to the entire CFS RQ. The problem with that initial approach was that <clears throat> because the deadline is higher priority than the, than the FIFO mm -hmm. scheduler, what would happen is that the, the CFS scheduler would run before the RT, and this will break everybody's here scenario. The wow. the, mm -hmm. So now what we are working, then we have, ju just for you to have an idea of why things take takes time. Then the first idea was writing a new scheduler just to schedule the, the CFS, right? <clears throat> but this would break the, the SCAD deadline. 
And then we started discussing the idea of deferring the activation of the deadline, reser deadline uh, reservation of the CFS using the SCAD deadline. And that's the thing that we are pursuing now. And, 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 and that's what makes hard, right? Because I need, we need to add this, this option without breaking everybody else's uh, workload here. And we are reaching there. It takes time, but we are reaching there. Editing as less possible, as less options as possible to try to not regret in the future for the things that we did now. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why things are bringing end up running slow, but consistent. Yeah. It fits so, the parameter TK. Yes. <laughs> <coughs> okay, so are the uh, drive, device drivers going to be needing to be changed much? Um, to, I uh, hope to, not. That's the answer I was hoping to hear. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, what's, a good, what's, a good, what's the impact going to be once it's all upstream on the rest of the kernel? Is there anything that's going to have to go in and get changed before, or has everything been changed as part of doing it upstream, getting it all upstreamed? I think it's part of getting everything upstream. You think we're there? I think that's, okay. I mean, I have still a queue left, uh -huh. but this is like ARM, and there is not a lot of people asking for ARM right now, huh. and posting patches to the ARM list tall, and I have like mm -hmm. zero replies and like no one cares. Oh, I have well, we can fix that. But <laughs> to give you another example, I send patches towards ARM64. Yeah. And they look at it and they say, oh, we would like it a little bit different. And before I get to the point to react, they send already what they would like to merge. Oh, they really want it fast. Yeah. yeah. So you okay. see, that's like the difference, like 100% uh -huh. in the other direction. OK, so ARM64 is reacting and ARM32 is not. Right. And okay. Risk Five came along and they presented like four patches mm -hmm. and then I pointed them what they need to do and then we reduce it to three. Mm -hmm. One which they merge and one and two they have to keep and this is like risk five. Okay. So they asked for it as well. So those are like the good ones. Okay. Um, are there any architectures that are going to have problems um, and not so, have access to it? Uh, so I remember the early days with 3.10 or 4.0 yeah. you had to do a lot of work to get the timers right, to get perf right, to get this and that, mm -hmm. and kernel exit ex and so on. But these days we have most of the things generic. So okay. you look at Risk Five, which was a new architecture, and use almost everything in a generic way that was supposed to happen. They had very very little work to do. Excellent. And so for other architectures like MIPS, for instance, they would have to either go for the generic way or mm -hmm. look what we did for the others to manage it. And do the, do the, do the ports for their own architectures themselves. Right. They want to keep working with it. Okay. The, the good point is that the discussions now are just following the regular kernel development, right? They are not the prem 30 as an isolated patch set working there first. Right. They're they happening on, on the regular workflow, right? But this is what I have the pleasure like to do these days. Like this is broken today with for the interrupts. This is broken today with um, HR timers. This is broken into this and this assumption. Mm -hmm. And we have a document and the code is already there. In the past, I pointed people to the tree to point out the problems and no one really cared because it's one, it yet, another, <laughs> yes, yet another out of tree project. So this was um, really hard to work with. But we had like the tracing came mm -hmm. out from the RT project. So it wasn't, yeah, like um, we need tracing because of RT, like we could sell it, we need tracing because we don't have anything for the tracing thing. Yeah. And this was easy. And the more we got out of the RT tree mainline, mm -hmm. the less people were interested to get actually the remaining RT bits because a lot of... The, the benefits were already mostly in the kernel. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so just, just recalling here, most, most of the things that we that we were, there are a lot of kernel options that were parameter first that are not parameter RT anymore for long ago and people just forget about it. Like F trace was an uh, RT thing. The whole tracing thing yeah, was the, RT only. Yeah. yeah. So all those things, they, that was when the RT started merging with the kernel. Well, I think right. one of the first things East was lockstep <coughs> because um, mm -hmm. back then it was like 2.6 or even 2.4 where the machines locked up because SMP wasn't like that common. So machines locked up randomly and no one knew why and locked up started pointing out the problems and this came out from the RT tree back mm -hmm. then. High resolution time was also one of the things yeah. okay. back then. Mm -hmm. 
So do we have questions from the audience? Do, yeah. Is there any question that you guys would like to, to chat about? Uh, we got one. Great. Um, well, I thought I'd, uh, I think the topic, this topic was what's next, right? Yep. So, next. and you said that, as you said, I like it's, you know, this is about building community and we have this great community. Yeah, <clears throat> so what do you guys see as the next, I mean, okay, the, the, the big lift has been up, you know, doing the work uh -huh. and it's going to be upstream. So what else should, is the community working on next? I think we had really good discussions in the room today about, you know, ed there's certain many other things around tuning, education. But I'm curious what you guys think that the community should focus on next. Uh, I, I have ideas, but then, like, okay, we've figured out what the requirements are in t implicitly for real time. I'd love to have them surfaced explicitly. I, I think that we, as a community, have been focused a lot of this in the scheduling latency as the problem for real time, myself included. But now what I'm seeing is that this is working the, the community is working fine, and this is, is let's say, <clears throat> something we can rely on. And the challenge on real time are also moving to the scheduling of not only one task per CPU that will give you the highest latency, but for multiple tasks sharing the same CPU and trying to get not latency but response time. So one example was today, like the the idea of consolidation, consolidation multiple, consolidating multiple systems into fewer CPUs, and then we start going towards the scheduling side. Like how do I share a CPU with multiple real-time tasks with uh, most of the tasks making the deadline? That, that's one point that I see. And then we go to deadline scheduling and, uh, and, and more problems with lockings because when we start having tasks sharing the same CPU, the problem with locking becomes more evident. <laughs> and what I'm seeing that that there is developing being done that goes right in, in the kernel, in the kernel regular workflow, not necessarily on the RT anymore, because RT is part of the kernel. It's, it's the work with the proxy execution that we need to figure out a better way for priority inheritance. And uh, one thing that I will start working with uh, is having multiple schedulers inside that deadline reservation so we can share the, uh, a CPU among multiple tasks using the, the SCAD deadline parameters. But just that you mentioned, is proxy execution going somewhere? It seems, what, what I'm seeing is that there's part of the patch set that they, it seems that they split the patch set as a set of uh, pre-requirements for it. So it's being worked on, would you say? Yeah. What's and next, future? Yeah, <laughs> that's what's next. Yeah. So it's being worked on and it's supposed to be worked on? That's the no, question. people are working on, on it. Uh -huh. So it's present, not the future. Well, yeah, it's not to done be merged. Yet, so it's future. <laughs> yeah, okay. it'll be, it'll the future. It'll be future oh, yeah, to be merged in the I future. I mean, we've been talking about it for years now, right? Well, yeah. yeah, but now we're working on it. So that's like a big step forward. <laughs> <laughs> that's like a big step forward. Yeah. No, yeah. Yeah, also the, 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 the throttling problem. We started talking about it in 2016, 17. <laughs> but I wasn't like aware that this is like a that big issue. The throttling? Yeah. No, it is the, now. Like for example, on our use case, uh, those people that were running the NFV use case here, where you run a single task on isolated CPU, they run the task. They would like to run it 100% of the time. What is happening with us is that there is always a K worker that runs up on the CPU, and this locks the system. You will see warnings or something like that. <clears throat> you see when it's too late. Is it? Yeah, that, that's where we're getting. So with the DL server, we boosted the CFS for like, because the SCAD deadline, we can give like very high resolution slices of time. We can set the CFS to run like 20 microseconds every second, just to unlock the situation. But you do it like over and over again, right? If, uh, it depends on how often something will go to the isolated CPU. Because then you might just want to get rid of the worker. <coughs> yeah, for example, there, there, are key, there are one of the cases is with VMstat. When you dispatch the workload... But didn't we fix that part? Where the no, MM, not yet. Didn't MM say we don't care about accurate res, uh, statistics, we can just avoid it? No, they are still happening. Seriously? I think so. I thought MM said we can... I, I think that patch set from Marcelo was 
was not yet merged. But we have other use cases like people dispatching the workload on isolated CPUs, and then the, the, there's the script that dispatches the real-time workload, yeah, yeah, and yeah, the yeah. script hangs on that CPU because real-time workload preempts it. That's correct, yes. Well, certainly real-time is very popular in industrial operations, and that's one of the main use cases. Oz is an automotive, potentially now, yeah. and things like that. And so um, safety and the Linux kernel and safety um, and making real-time be accessible for people doing the analysis for safety is something I think will come in yeah. the next few years. Um, and that's why the Elisa project's been working with the preemptor team. In fact, I learned about safety mostly from the real-time project and Thomas, lots of talking with Thomas oh, about it. He was basically educating me for several times about why this is important, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. And so, you know, a lot of my education came from talking to Thomas about safety. And I think, you know, it's because uh, most people that care about safety are using real-time in some fashion. And so the fact is now we need to start surfacing out the information so that they can do the right analysis. And so there's various people working on that. So I think that'll be starting to come. That's yeah, one thing I'm yeah. aware of. Yeah, and, and this, this is the, the problem is start going to the end of this execution of the task, not only for the scheduling. The, scre the scheduling is the, the, the minimum thing that we need, but we need to place the task to run and, and see the end of the execution. And then we yeah. start going to the real-time analysis for the scheduling. Yeah. 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 Okay, so years ago we merged the SCAD DL. Yeah. Does anything happen on the front or is it like all done, all stable, all fancy? What we have now is, is stable. We, we haven't seen like critical bugs for quite a while. Okay. <coughs> yeah, so pe people can use. It's just that it's too restrictive yet because we don't... So we, if, if we have uh, the the real-time throttling enabled, there is the setup that limits the CPU, we end up engaging one thing that is the admission control of the deadline scheduler. The admission control, the idea is that it will not allow the system to, to run more than, than the CPUs that the system has, right? And there is, and this limits ourselves to the scheduler being global. That is, the scheduler will put the tasks on all available CPUs in the root domain. So you cannot set affinities for the real-time tasks. And that's too restrictive for most of the workloads because people would like to set affinities. It, it's a basic tuning, right? Mm -hmm. okay. Nowadays, you can bypass that, but, but bypass that disabling the real-time uh, runtime, the throttling argument. It's not only throttling. You can disable the, 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 the admission control and you can manage and place the deadline tasks wh wherever you want. That, that works, but what we are seeing in the research is that doing global isn't efficient anyways. So we are trying to pursue it, uh, ways to partition the system on, on other methods. And that's a task that I have on my to-do for quite a while. Mm -hmm. It's the same mm -hmm. partition the scheduler. DDL server is, is, the f is a pre-requirement for that. Mm, okay. Well, Things are moving. Things are moving. Um, <coughs> are there places where people can get engaged? So if there's someone that's really interested in real-time problems, how do they start engaging and helping? Well, I've seen the talk here and there, what people went through to set up the RT system. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was way easier because most of the things I've seen was like, this is obvious, this is well known, this is, yeah, it's written in the trace. But apparently it would be nice to have it like documented everything in one place. Like what does a problem look like? What tools look for? And mm -hmm. what's like the things to do? Mm. Okay. We, there's a question here. Okay. Just say, we have a good starting point you know, on the real time tuning guide for Red Hat. It's open. But yeah, I see your point. It's, it's focused on the use case that we have. That's not everybody else's. And it has this tune D thing, which is it works. Yeah, but it does things <laughs> that are not documented, right? <coughs> it's documented in Python. No, it does. <laughs> <laughs> we have to look up. <laughs> uh, yep. So it's more a remark on that than a question. Uh, you, you raise a very good point. It feels like people are re rediscovering again and again how to set up an RT system. Uh, from my point of view, the thing that uh, 
had the most impact in the past few years was RTLA. Uh, because we finally have a way for users who are not very knowledgeable about um, what's going on on the system at the hardware level, at the kernel level, the scheduling level, uh, and also people who are not familiar with tracing at all. We finally have one tool uh, to get easily all of the information that we need to do the investigation. And to me, um, the fact that PremptRT gets merged at some point uh, is not going to change that much uh, with that. It's just applying a patch, uh, enabling the option. Uh, for people, it's just going to be one less step. But the, the, the road that is going to be uh, well left uh, in front of us is going to be more, in my opinion, about educating people about uh, that. Uh, how do we configure everything properly? and what's going on in the hardware system. So the thing I would like to see is more tools like RTLA or um, yeah, m easiest way to do some analysis about what's going on for people who don't really want to know about what's going on behind the scenes. And I don't say that to, to uh, be mean about people who, who work on the preempt RT patch because it's really awesome work, but it's not something that the users can even sometimes just understand or want to understand. So that was just a, a remark on that. <laughs> and, and I didn't pay a, a peer for him to make this decision. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think that, <clears throat> so that's, that's get, getting back to the point that things take time, right, to be done in the right way. The RTLA idea was born in 2010. So that, were, that was when it, it came to my mind, that the question was like, okay, <clears throat> intuitively I know that the parameter RT has a bounded scheduling latency. How do I abstract it to the point that I could convince the real-time academic community that there was a bound, right? <clears throat> so how can I explain them? Because once I explain them how the bound is composed, I can build the tools that I can explain why things are broken, right? That, and from that to the tool to be merged in the kernel, it took 12 years, right? So, mm -hmm. but, but along the way, we extract a lot of cool things. Yeah. So I started, I had to, f I had to learn how to, to do tracing efficiently to try to explain what was the response time of a task on Linux. <coughs> and then just doing <coughs> tracing wasn't enough to explain. Then I had to learn a formal method that I could describe the system. And then I created this this model of how the prem RT works. And from that, I took out the, RV, the RV subsystem that I need to put more work on it. But I, I took that as an output. And then I took the, the, the formal definition of the scheduling latency. It's like, okay, this is how the latency is composed. And I, I took out a, a proof of concept two that's still not on RTLA, the RTSL, when I talk on, on 2020 at Plumbers. <coughs> And that too, it was cool, but it was depending on things that are disabled by default on kernel, like the preempt IRQ disable tracer, because it adds too much overhead. <clears throat> and then I had to think, okay, how can I take the, pro the benefits of that abstractions from that tool, but still make it usable without having these options that we cannot enable? And then it came with the idea of the timer lot. And once I had timer lot, it was able to extract the auto analysis because the analysis was built on this composition of, of tasks. It, it took a long time ago, but something that I hopefully will not regret, because once we regret of editing something in the kernel, you... Yeah, and, and I, I think, <laughs> I think it, it, it's good to see that take time, but I, I think that's one of the things I wanted to maybe spur conversation here and there is because <laughs> your, what you just said, I've heard from many other people, right? And I think, you know, I just want to say that I, we talked about this earlier, but I think be, because it's a close to being mainstream and because of some uh, things in the industry that are aligning to, to mm -hmm. this need and wanting to be, some of us, you know, wanting to be on mainstream Linux and, and security, I think the, the need is quite urgent in uh, things to diagnose, to benchmark, uh, guides on how to, because I, I think, you know, I've seen and we've heard of many people who are now you know, kicking the tires from outside. And, you know, there's, as you said, it's not just about learning about the schedule or preempt RT. It's about all of the other things that we've discussed today. So is there some way we can 
focus the community on these more? And as you said, Eddie, you were trying to go there with the, how do people get involved? How do we get, you know, because you've been working on, it sounds like you've been, and maybe Deep on the points. RTLA, but how do we get, you know, more yeah. people but, rowing? No, yes. but, but I think that the point is that once we get something right in the kernel, yeah. it creates momentum. Yeah. And this momentum pushes people to work together into a, a, a good solution for everybody. That's why sometimes things take time to get into the kernel. Because <clears throat> you need to make something that is good for all possible use cases. And then this creates momentum and creates more people developing now. Editing more analysis to RTLA now, it's, it's just user space C code processing trace. It's, it's easy to contribute to RTLA. It's, it's user space code mostly. So, and I, mean, I think maybe, that maybe, same maybe thing that as, happens with- As my point is, yeah, I mean, you're talking about the development process <coughs> takes something, but I think maybe when I'm talking about focusing, we had a great presentation over there from someone He said, you know, he did a whole bunch of work and he said, if I would have known about RTLA, which, you know, whatever years ago, he would have saved him a lot, right? So, you yeah. know, part of community is awareness and, and other things as well. That's right? why we have this event. That's right. Yeah. That's right. That's, that's, why, that's why we're that's trying to reasons. basically have, and it's being recorded, so hopefully we can point people at it when people yeah. don't, um, you know, aren't aware of things. And certainly LWN does a very nice job oh. of, of writing things up for us. <coughs> and uh, I've used that search feature many a time to double check some things. Thank you. Yeah. No, but yeah, yeah but, but that's it. You see, there are many people here discussing the same thing. Right. See, most of the presentations were hitting the same. We need to enable this option. We need to disable that option. And, and, th and that's the part of the community sharing knowledge. And, and that's one of the motivations for this event. It's uh, sharing these this common oh. things that we have. Right. Okay, so I'm going to be a little bit contrary in here. Um, <laughs> of course, Tim, of course. I tried to convince some people in the space sector that Linux was real time, and they were not buying it. Um, and I think there's a messaging problem. Uh, the last time I went uh, to a presentation about RTLA, it seemed like it was a tool that showed you all the different ways that Linux failed at real time. Um, <laughs> because it identifies all these things, like in the kernel or other places, where the real time you know, didn't, didn't go according to plan. And you know, sure, you, there's ways to fix it. But it's like that's uh, that's a counter message, right, to the fact that it's that Linux is a real-time system. On that presentation, the guy doing the presentation was trying to force cases. <laughs> <laughs> no, but no, but seriously speaking, okay. seriously speaking, uh, real time is not only about latency, but response time, and by about defining well your your workload, right. Mm -hmm. So you need to understand your workload and understand how to fit it into the execution model of Linux. Uh, we need the tools to help to identify when Linux misbehave, right? But that's the common process for every operating system. If you, if you have an operating system that because of the workload is failing on the metric, you need to find ways to show it. <clears throat> but with a correctly set up system, Linux is reaching for sure, millisecond uh, granularity with uh, w with space for, for for error. There are tools just. But to come up yeah. with a different example, if you buy yourself a 100G networking card, you most likely don't get the 100G out of it right away. So you go ahead and you start tuning. You may be looking at BPF and XDP to get the last bits out of it. It's not working out of the box as it is, I think. Because this is what I've seen uh, looking through the pages, like how to split the queues, how to do this, how to put the workload through it. So it's not like unique solution just to buy a 100G card and be done. Yeah. The same thing applies mostly to RT as well. And I'll also basically put a plug in for one of the Real Time Linux Project members, OSADL, who spends a lot of time actually characterizing systems running real time and being able to let you have more visibility into what's what's actually happening that's an area that they, and that's part of why yeah. they've been supporting the project is you know so if you've got certain parameters you want to do they can basically <coughs> bring the long test and they've got a whole infrastructure for really understanding what's going on on a certain version and things like that with, with, with CPU isolation like trying to create the best scenario you create CPU isolation you run RTLA timer that now <coughs> 
on a paper that we are working on on a rail rail operating system. It's not an embedded thing. It's rail, huge chunk of of, of kernel, <laughs> right? <coughs> with rail, with CPU isolated, we were reaching like less than 10 microseconds scheduling latency, right? With with the tuning, then if they start putting their real time workload on that CPU, then things they have a clean space to start working. Uh, okay, so. I'm sorry, but the impression is that an expert, after checking a hundred different tuning options, can get it to a good latency. And so, I mean, that's the impression that's out there. Mm. And, and yeah, and then, then we have tools like TuneD that helps. Oh, come on. <laughs> and have RTLA. Yes, it requires some, some level of expert expertise to make things work properly. But things are getting better. Uh, I will start showing better results. Yeah. On so speaking presentation. of the topic of education go. that was raised and given that preempt RT should be mainline soon, isn't it the time to have like, for example, one Dioctor project, which is also a Linux Foundation sponsored project, has an amazing like set of documentation, hundreds of pages that are really helpful. Maybe is, it's the time for like a detailed book or a detailed <laughs> manual about the topic, given well, how hard RT is. The thing is, we do have a wiki, and I point people towards the wiki, and there are people coming on the mailing list, coming with a problem, and I say, this, this is, is this working for you? And they come back and say, yes, thank you. And then I ask them to update the wiki, and <coughs> this never happens. And I think that people using RT from the industry have a different mentality compared to those running mm -hmm. software using Yocto, right? It's the if, same people. Any volunteers are welcome to help us to get the documentation better, is I think what the answer is. <laughs> yeah, for, but yeah, it's not sure. because John is here, but I think the best place to, to put these, these details is in the kernel documentation. I agree completely. <coughs> it needs to be upstream in the docs. Uh, RTLA document, <coughs> the timer lot tracer, RTLA, RV, all the documentation I'm placing inside the kernel because it, it has a big it has a bigger notion of value if it's in the kernel yeah. because it creates this momentum of the Linux kernel and, and it helps people to contribute more. And it has a higher <coughs> quality threshold and yeah, it multiplies have been at it. Hopefully the maintainers yeah, have reviewed it too. That's, that's why I placed the RTLA inside, mm -hmm. tried to put inside the kernel because it raises the bar of quality. Right, mm -hmm. that's why we tried to get some of the elites to work yeah. up into the kernel too in terms of you know, methodologies <coughs> for looking at trick. You know, Sometimes I get like some that. emails saying, Daniel, you shouldn't have done that way and I need to work a lot, but it raises the bar. Okay. So you think we should add the primary RT documentation yeah. To the kernel directly, <coughs> yes, please. <coughs> or, or, yes. or, for example, we have many, <laughs> many parameters here that are on the command line, right? Right. We could maybe editing a tag saying, "Oh, this from from a real time documentation pointing, maybe be an index of options because there will be things on the on the real time that will be on the documentation on the RTLA, part on the SCAD deadline, part on the kernel command line, part on RCU. It's 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 maybe an index of pointers on the kernel documentation." Basically, a primer on here's how to go find out how to go do it and yeah, print all the pieces because that need. For example, it's okay. deadline, and this would help contribute to improve the kernel documentation. We we could uh, we could split <coughs> kernel parameters dot text and have a real time parameters dot text. Kernel parameters dot text is so long, and all those real time parameters are in there, but you have to read through a lot of it and have a lot of knowledge of More what you're searching by topic for area to use it. Yeah. Or, or maybe grouping the current uh, by topic. Grouping Not, by topic. Because duplicating, duplicating source of information, same information, you create inconsistencies and in one side, because people might update that and might not update that. We could, we <coughs> could do it with the HTML formatted output, maybe. Yeah, I, there, I don't there know. Might, there, the docker experts might have a better answer. But I, I would... For example, <coughs> on RTLA, I use includes because there is one main page that uses the same uh, options from the other, so I include in the same file. So when I w when I change with the the option description, I change on all the main pages and all documentation. Maybe we could use, we could use and include the thing to, but duplicating the same information on two two spaces is uh, prone to inconsistencies. I Ho think hopefully the, doc the documentation Sorry. maintainer liked what I said. Maybe he has some comments. <laughs> yeah, I think another approach would be uh, like uh, to completely. 
Pardon me? Do we like? Here. I have one. Don't you hear me? I didn't, didn't want to interrupt the other comment. Sorry. Um, much of the kernel documentation, like kernel parameters, that text, was basically thrown into a big pile in the kernel. And this is something that I've been, since I took over maintainership eight years ago, um, have been, been trying to fix by trying to organize our documentation with the reader in mind. So that if you're a particular sort of audience, a particular reader with a certain sort of task, that you can go to the same thing. You don't have to plow through a whole bunch of stuff that is just not totally intended for you, but for someone who's like trying to modify the driver or whatever like that. So, I mean, great ideas. I encourage help in, in doing this. This has been a, a multi-year effort and we are far from done with it. But I think that like splitting out some RT related manuals would be a very good idea. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Um, I mean, another approach uh, is to, it would, uh, from my point of view, it would be better to eliminate the number of kernel parameters because from a point of view, uh, from the viewpoint of a secure boot system, it's not always possible to dynamically uh, adapt the kernel parameters. And my impression on the parameters regarding the use case is uh, choosing the right parameters depends on your workload. And if you're trying to provide a platform for customers where we have, where have, where you have multiple use cases, you cannot always choose the parameters ahead of time for your platform. So moving to like more like parameters which you, which you can modify during the runtime would be, would maybe a better idea. But that, but that that's a trend in the kernel mm. in the kernel developers, right? It's just that sometimes. Removing a kernel parameter requires reworking part of the kernel, mm -hmm. and this reworking part of the kernel takes time. That's that's the ISO CPU case. Yeah. <coughs> How are we doing on time here, actually? No, I think what he asked for is to have this. Oh, I think we're getting close to time. Okay. Keep going. Yeah, maybe, maybe. I think the question was if you could have some of the parameters switch at runtime instead of boot time. And depending what the parameters are, not all of them are compatible with this. Simply because you need to make decision at boot time, so either you fire it up or you don't fire it up at all. Yeah. So this is tricky. For instance, um, you can switch the preemption model, but you patch the whole kernel, and this can be done only once. Um, but you cannot switch the timer model um, via command line. This is only compile only. And if you could switch it at, um, make it switchable, it would be also one of the things that you could do only at boot time. And for some parameters, this thing applies. So it's boot time only. But the, the trend inside of the kernel is to make this thing dynamic. It's just that it needs to rework fundamental parts of the kernel. And when this happens, it's harder because we cannot break what is, ex what is now if we want to keep our job. <laughs> So that's that's why it take, takes time, and 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 the time you showed that that that's the correct way to do, right? That's why Linux is what it is. Last um, question, I guess. Yes, um, my question is about the documentation of things that are not so relevant for the most of the users, but for some it's quite relevant, like the kernel threads. So at least I don't know of uh, a single documentation page where you see all the kernel threads, their priorities, what they are for, what to, what is important when I change the priorities of these kernel threads. So having something like that would be would be really really good. So this got cleaned up a few releases ago. So as we have sketched other, or you have RT priority 150 or 99, and this is it. We don't have anything in between. And 50 is like the middle one. One is, we don't care. It's not that important, but it should be important that everything is get other. And then you have 99, which is like super important, and you shouldn't touch it at all. We don't have that. <coughs> oh, come on. The CFS is now a deadline task. With this new dropping, it will be. See? Okay, so this gets thing. Come on, come on. So. You, take, because, you need a bit more. I mean, this is a good step forward, but you need more if you if you actually have to pave a way from your I/O event to your real-time 
workload. Mm. So you have to know which of these middle thingy is in, under which condition important for my OPAS. I can, I can do the tracing wise ah, okay. thingy, but uh, if I have to trace my system first of all to do that tuning, then comes also this reconfigurable thing on, on, the, on, the, on the radar. So how do I react on that if my, uh, my workload is changing? So it's, it's a little bit more complicated. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's getting way simpler, but it's not quite there yet. But this depends, yeah, but like, it's... what hardware do you have and what yes, scheduling yes, do you yes. have and <clears throat> what file system yeah. do you have? And yeah, this is yeah, not yeah. unique. Yeah. It's easy. It's just we remove out the code, and then all the options are just one. The, the <laughs> Linux is complex because it <laughs> handles... Come on, it handles the cell phone, it handles the, the real time, it handles the, the thing on space. Hopefully in the future they will believe on us. It, it has options because it, uh, it has many use cases. That, that's a good thing, people. That's a good thing. Okay. Motivated, I, 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 Daniel. I, 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 do think, I do think we are pretty much out of time, so you are the last question. Okay. Yeah, so it's not a question. It's just I want to share the experience like for my uh, presentation in the afternoon. So I, I'm not a, a kernel guy or uh, the, the Linux uh, person. So, but uh, I just want to share my experience when I debugging that issue. I, I refer a lot to the chat GPT to find out the, the meaning of the kernel, uh, you know, the options related to the kernel. Uh, if you don't work on this, it, it, it will be confusing to uh, understand what that means. So I just curious uh, if you have like, uh, consider about have you planned like uh, integrating uh, the solutions uh, to some of the, the AI tools? If I want to, for a, for a user like me, okay, I want to debug the latency issue. I just type those words and uh, okay, it, it prompt, uh, okay, some suggestions and uh, hey, you could try maybe the uh, the RT uh, LA tool and uh, something like the that. Po the point is chat, chat, chat GPT doesn't know RTLA, I asked him. <laughs> it doesn't know, and then, and then yeah. it points you to the wrong direction. But if you have searched on the on the kernel docs about the real scheduling latency in the search boot on the kernel documentation, it will point you there. Yeah. Well, I, I think we need to curate the chat GPT and basically say if it's getting it wrong somehow and be able no, to feed I, that. I, I tried least. chat GPT, how to debug RSU latency. It was it was a super cat later, Italian term to say yes. <laughs> It, it, okay. it missed it. Next, Sorry so me. no, it's okay. So, we need to teach ChatGPT to say, "Read the kernel docs." Yes, that, that's a good starting point. Okay. Well, thank you very much, everyone, and uh, thank you to our panelists. <laughs>